Yeah, we're both feeling it right now. Well, hey, you know who else is feeling it, but in a good way? That's Texas football and this yeah. coaching staff that is just getting it done uh, at every level right now. What a day it was yesterday for Texas. You guys at Horns 24-7 have been all over this, but about three commitments for the Longhorns, one in the transfer portal, one for the class of 2024, and one for the class of 2025. I guess we can go in that order, Jeff. I mean, what a day for the Longhorns. We'll start with Andrew Makuba, uh, the LBJ kid coming back home. Big-time player at Clemson the last few years. Feels like an immediate plug-and-play starter at a, a pretty serious position of need for this uh, Texas team. For sure. You know, we've talked about safety being one of the big needs this this team had in the transfer portal. And, you know, we'll get to Xavier Filsamy, but, you know, Makuba – Makuba can serve two functions. One, you know, obviously you need safety depth, period. So he'll he'll help you on that front, too. He gives you an option to, you know, you're, you're losing a really important part of this defense with Jaday Barron, you know, likely to move on. I, I don't expect Jaday at this point to come back. I, I, don't, I don't know that anybody's expecting him to come back. So, you know, you're going to need somebody at that star position now. You know, it, could it be Jalen Gilbo? Could it be Austin Jordan? I guess. But, you know, Makuba can g- gives you an option to play somebody there. Uh, but I think you're starting to see, you know, we, we've seen under Sark, we've seen position groups kind of evolve on the fly and transform themselves on the fly. We've seen offensive line do it. We've seen interior D line do it. Uh, I think safety is one of those, one of the groups that kind of hasn't yet. Uh, we haven't really seen that transformation take place, but you've got the kind of guys now with, with Makuba, with Derek Williams in the program already with, with Phil Samy. That position now, more than ever, BK, we see it plenty on Sundays. You see it on Saturdays in college football. You know, teams are more willing to test the middle of the field. You've got to have guys with ball skills at, at the safety position. Got to have guys yeah. who are instinctive. And Texas really hasn't had that. So, you know, Makuba gives you that. Phil is going to give you that. But, yeah, Makuba's a, a guy that's going to come in right away. And uh, I think probably, you know, when you get to the spring game, depending on what the format looks like, uh, you know, I, I – it's tough to say, you know, is he going to come in and you know be a guy that starts over Michael Taff? He could not, maybe not line up with the ones for the first snap of spring ball, but you know, probably by the end of spring practice, I think you'll see Makuba and uh, and Derek Williams will be your number one safety group going into twenty twenty four. Yeah, and Makuba is one of those kids. Uh, of course, Jeff, if if you needed him and a, a cornerback went down, he's such an athlete. I mean, he was a wide receiver. He really moves. He's real fluid. I mean, and he's and he's long, and he's been in the trenches already. He's had a couple of years under his belt on a pretty good Clemson team. But I, I just thought this was such a, a a great get. I mean, he yeah he he's such a good athlete. You know, just watching him move, you can just tell. And and he's a big and he's not a little skinny kid. He was a skinny kid in high school, a thinner kid. But he's he's built out right now. I mean, he's had a couple of years in college. I mean, he looks like a guy that can, you can plug and place him in a lot of spots if need be. I know you don't want to, but mm. who knows how this this secondary is going to end up because they're going to have to they're going to have to recruit some cornerbacks. There are going to be some young guys playing cornerback here very shortly, I believe. Yeah, um, I think you know. I actually think on on the corner deal, Buck. I mean, you got Terrence Brooks. You know, let's assume Ryan Watts moves on, which I think we probably all expect him to at this point. You know, you're going to go into next year where Terrence Brooks has pretty much a full year starting experience. I really like what what Malik Muhammad shown over the back half of the season, uh, especially being a guy that's long and that can play mm-hmm. some, you know, get up and jam you and, and play some not just tighter coverage. But you can get up and play some bump and run coverage. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you're 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 getting longer where you want to be at corner. The the thing about Makuba in terms of his versatility, you know, I'm just looking at his pro football focus numbers. I got them pulled up again. Uh, you look at his snap counts over his career at Clemson, almost 300 snaps in his career uh, as a box defender, uh, almost 700 at safety, and over 700 working in the slot at, at that nickel position. So, again, a guy – and he's got you know only 30 snaps at corner, but he does have corner snaps in his yeah. career. So, you know, all that, all that said, I mean, you've got a guy that can fill a number of different spots for you. And, and unlike – you know, unlike Jalen Catalan, where I think we were all just kind of hoping, hey, can he stay healthy? And, you know, that didn't come to fruition. And that's no fault of Jalen Catalan's. It's just the body just let him down time and time again in his career. You know, Makuba's a guy that I think probably just needs a change of scenery because you look at what he did in 2021, Bucky. He was one of the top safeties, oh, yeah. re- really one of the top young safeties in the country. Uh, was ACC Defensive Rookie of the Year, didn't have a great sophomore year, had a better junior year. But I think maybe for him just to – 
just a change of scenery. Yeah, he wants uh, to come and, home and, and getting back home. I think would be would would yep. probably do him some good. So this isn't a guy where you're talking about who has this extensive injury history where you're you know hope is the only plan you've got. Hoping his body won't let him down. No. I think this is just a guy that needs to just needs a fresh outlook on things. And again, just maybe just being in a different color jersey, being being back in his in his backyard, close to home. Maybe that helps him out, kind of re- recapture that form he showed in 21 sure. where he was a lights-out player for Clemson. Yeah, speaking of home, Xavier Filsamy, a name that you brought up a couple of moments ago, Jeff. He's staying home. Played his high school football at McKinney up in the Metroplex. Has been committed to Florida for a long, long time. Kind of felt like the worst-kept secret in college football, but Filsamy made it official yesterday, flipping his commitment from Florida to Texas. Expected to be an early enrollee. He's a part of that safety room that you're talking about with the, the future of Texas football feels like a, another big time get and Blake Gideon who's been criticized yeah. a lot by Texas fans. You got to tip the cap to him. He's done a pretty tremendous job. Hadn't he? Yeah. It's uh, you know, the, the thing with Phil to me that we keep going back to and, and Mike Roach and Jordan and I talked about this last week, you know, Texas quote unquote got it on him late. Well, you know, Mike has had a, a, a really good pulse on this recruitment and it was one of those deals where, and he was a track kid and I think had an injury at some point. So Ted, so the evaluation was delayed for everybody. And it was just one of those deals where, uh, you know, some teams, Florida being one of them kind of took a gamble on him. And when he started to blow up, you know, Texas decided, Hey, you know, he's healthy. Let's go back and, and take a look at him. And at that point, the staff said, Hey, you know, is it too late to get in on this kid? And the, the high school coaches, his high school coach was like, well, I mean, he's, he's about to commit to Florida. So, but credit Blake Gideon and, and that defensive staff are just kind of staying on him and and not giving up in that recruitment. You know, there's a handful of recruitments, and Bucky, you know this, having been in that position, there's a handful of recruitments that even if the, a kid commits to a school early, um, man, until he puts pen to paper, that kid is so good and can be such a difference maker for you. Man, you stay on that kid, even if the answer is no. I mean, it could the answer could be a no up until the eleventh hour, and yep. and if and persistence could end up paying off. And I think persistence ended up paying off for Texas. And to the point where, you know, when Texas really started to make some moves in that recruitment, what happened to Florida? Florida fired Corey Raymond, who was a secondary coach over there, who Phil Smith was really close with. And that was your end right there. So you were able to pounce. And at that point, <laughs> he'd had a better relationship with Blake Gideon uh, than he had with Will Harris, who was just hired, I think, like two weeks ago to be Florida's new secondary coach. So plus, I mean, with the Florida situation, and I, I don't want to put words in, in Xavier's mouth, but, you know, who knows where that regime is going to be a year You're from right. now? I mean, Billy Napier's on a hot seat, and uh, you know it's 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 crazy. We saw this really for the first time in my lifetime under Mac, where you know, Texas was kind of the cool school to go to, and you saw kids in this state by and large. They weren't talking to them anymore about going to AM. They weren't talking about going out of state to go to Michigan or Notre Dame or UCLA or Miami or anywhere else. The top kids in the state wanted to come to Texas. Why? Well, yeah, I mean, Ricky won a Heisman, and like I said, Texas was the cool place, but you Texas started winning football games consistently. And I think now, you know, Sark doesn't have to sell hopes and dreams, and here's what we think we can be in the future. Like, hey, this is – this is where we're at. We're, we're, we're in the college football playoff in year three, and now you're going to the SEC. So you're able to sell tangible things right now to recruits. And this is the way it should be, BK. I mean, you look at where Texas has everything lined up. You've got the on-field success. You've got a staff that really enjoys the recruiting process. And, you know, all, all that kind of ties in together with the NIL advantage that Texas has. There's no reason why Texas – Texas is always going to get players – now you should be able to get year in and year out, get the difference makers that you need to make you competitive in the SEC. And if you're competitive in the SEC, the playoff talk we're talking about now, this shouldn't be kind of a one and done flash in the pan thing. This should be every year you at least put yourself in a position to be in the conversation. Uh, with Sweat winning the uh, Outland Trophy, that has to be just in, that's got to be incredible for this, for this group now, too, when it comes to recruiting defensive linemen. I mean, they ought to be able to. I mean, I know the portal's wide open. There's got to be some guys that already leave their places. Texas got to take advantage of some guys on the defensive front somehow, some way, unless yeah. they got a whole stockpile of them somewhere that I don't know about. Yeah, the the problem with that, Bucky, is, you know, those guys are in short supply. They're just on yeah. a ton of, you know, 6'4", 300-plus pound athletes just, you know, falling off trees you know those, those those guys are tough to find they got a kid in this class who i mean i think has a chance to be one of those guys and you know i know 
uh, talking to our guys on the, on the rankings team at 24 seven sports. Uh, you know, they've seen them. A couple of those guys have seen them live. Deontre Robinson's a kid out of Orlando, six, four, three fifteen. You watch the tape, just incredibly athletic, nimble feet. But what are the knocks on him right now? Well, you know, maybe it takes place off. You question the motor, you question the, the consistent intensity, man, that stuff, dude, uh, Bo Davis will either get that out of you real quick or you'll be out of here real quick. Yeah, so, how about a kid from Jersey? Is he getting closer? Yeah, Sadir Mitchell, I think, is a guy that, you know, the, the good thing about where Texas has been on the on the D-line front is they haven't had to play any of these young guys. They haven't had to rush no. these guys because they've had veterans in front of them. So Sadir Mitchell's been able to, to get some development time. It's going to be a really big spring, too, not just for Mitchell, but – you know, going into year three for Aaron Bryant and Jare Bledsoe and Zach Swanson, that group, that it's time for that group to show something. Somebody in that group has to separate yeah. and become a part of this rotation. And I think whether you're talking about adding another high school guy, because I think Dominic McKinley out of Louisiana, who we've, you know, there's been a lot of movement in that recruitment in the last 12 hours where, you know, now we're wondering, is he is he going to sign tomorrow instead of waiting until February? And hmm. te- Texas, for all intents and purposes, finished second to Texas A&M in the recruitment when he made the decision the first time around. Uh, is he going to sign? Is it going to be with A&M? You know, can Texas get that LOI at some point in that 72-hour window? So McKinley's the, the guy that they're going to continue to go after until he either signs with them or signs with somebody else. Uh but I think a lot of what they do in terms of the portal or adding another guy, I think a lot of that's going to depend on what Alfred Collins does. You know, mm-hmm. Alfred Collins has a decision to make. Does he go to the NFL as, as a four-year guy and take no. his chances, or or does he come back? And, you know, looking at what, you know, Keandre Coburn did with an extra year, now looking at what Tavondre Sweat's done with an extra year, does Alfred Collins say, well, you know, that extra year really benefited those other guys. I think that extra year could benefit me, so I'll come back and – and now you're talking again about for the third year in a row having a one-two punch at the top of your rotation with Collins and Vernon Broughton that uh, you don't worry about taking that group into the SEC. I think you'll be fine. It just becomes now what does the rotation look like behind them? You know, Trill Carter is a rotational guy. Trill Carter's got that COVID red shirt that he can use next year if he wants to, if the numbers work out and, and he wants to come back. So uh, I think for defensive tackle, interior D-line, yeah, the sweat thing can help you in recruiting, Bucky, and I think it's going to help them, but – there's so many moving parts yeah. with that position right now. It's tough to pin down. I don't even know if Bo Davis could tell you right now exactly what the plan is because, like I said, between Collins' decision, uh, McKinley kind of waiting to see what he does. Do you want to take another high school guy? Alex Foster's a kid uh, that's committed to Baylor who they had in over the weekend that I think if if he wants to sign right now, I think they'd probably be more willing to take him than if he waited. So just a lot of moving parts right now with that interior D-line group. Well, you, you, they're finding out that they need big – I mean, they knew they needed big people, but they're finding out more than anything this year got them to where they were because of those big people. Yeah. You know, they can't, they can't settle for somebody that's going to take three years to get big. You know, well, he's, he's going to develop in three years. No, they need to develop a, a guy in a year. In his sophomore year, he's got to be ready to go. Yeah, and, and when we can talk about the SEC being a space and pace league because it is becoming more of that with the kind of offenses we're seeing. At the end of the day, that league always has been, always will be yeah. the ultimate line of scrimmage league in college football. That's what separates that league from everybody else. And, yep. you know, we, we, you know, as a Texas fan, when you've seen Texas in these matchups with these SEC teams the last few years, whether it was Georgia in that Sugar Bowl or, or the, the home and home with Bama, what ended up being a one off with LSU. That's what that's the difference in that league is just there. God doesn't make that many humans, you know, to be that big and that athletic. Yeah. Uh, it, well, that's what and Jeff, that's what separated Michigan over the last three years about how they beat Ohio State. Yeah, the lines of scrimmages, you know, they're always going to have skilled guys, they're always going to have somebody that's going to be okay in their secondary, they're going to find a nice running back. <laughs> but the line of scrimmage that's not is, what separated them. They were cheating. That's what separated them. What? Come on, Come on, man. That's my sleeper team. You don't talk about my yeah, sleeper. Yeah, Bucky's like ultimate sleeper team, the number two team in the country to start what the year, the ultimate sleepers, those plucky underdogs, BK, the Wolverines. Yes, Nobody they, get saw those, it you know, they get those two stars and three stars and make them into five stars just like that. But, but they hadn't been like, you know, Michigan has always been, you know, had studs on the offensive line, but now they got those big guys that can move on the defensive line. And, the, yeah. and they've always had linebackers. They were always finding guys in the secondary. They've got a wide receiver somewhere, but it's now the defensive lineman. It's now those guys that are 300 pounders on the defensive line 
that move like their linebackers that I think you're finding out, which the SEC always had those guys. Yeah, Penn State's one of those programs that you figure, hey, you, you'll get skilled talent, but it hasn't been enough to make a difference. No. Penn State's got the opposite problem for some reason. Bucky, those Big Ten schools, like they got the line of scrimmage thing figured out. It's it's the other stuff that uh, oh yeah, they're on the struggle bus. Yeah, for sure. Jeff, we won't uh, have you use all of your material on us this morning. I know you and Jordan are going to be talking about all this stuff from 11 to noon here on Texas Sports Unfiltered, but I will ask from a transfer portal perspective, what's next? I mean, two portal acquisitions for Texas right now. They got Matthew Golden, the receiver out of Houston. Obviously, Andrew McCuba, the safety coming from Clemson. Uh, what sort of position group or position groups do you think this coaching staff is looking to attack in the portal? I think, you know, the the not necessarily a counterpoint or devil's advocate to what Bucky was just saying about interior D-line, but I think when you look at how they're trying to build this defense, for 2024 and trying to fill needs through the portal. To me, this is just kind of looking at the plan and, and me kind of trying to psychoanalyze PK and, and Sark. Uh, you know, Trey Moore, the, the edge rusher out of UTSA, you know, is he going to make a decision this week coming off of his visit to Alabama? He's already visited Texas. As far as we know, that's still Texas recruitment to lose. But maybe you're thinking, hey, we'll just have a little more pop off the edge, knowing that regardless whether Collins comes back or not, you're going to take a step back. I mean, if Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat, or Tavondre right. Sweat's out of eligibility, but if Byron Murphy moves on as we expect him to, you're going to take a little bit of a step back. Can you neutralize that a little bit by being better on the edges? And I think adding a guy like Trey Moore would help you do that. You know, a guy that had, what do you have, 14 sacks this year mm -hmm. at UTSA? So, yeah, the ed edge, I think specifically Trey Moore is, is the next piece. Uh, after that, I think they might just kind of hold Pat and, and see what the, what the, uh, what the attrition situation looks like whenever the season ends, whether that's, you know, after the sugar bowl or after the, the national championship game, how, when, wherever this thing ends and say, Hey, you know, man, if, if, you know, you're expecting Jalen Ford to move on, but if David Bender moves on, do, does, does off ball linebacker suddenly become a need? Uh, I don't think offensive line is going to be a need, you know, depending on what Jatavian Sanders decides. Now do you need to earmark a portal position for a tight end? So I think for right now, I think it's Trey Moore, and then I think there's going to be another point whenever the season's in the books where they reevaluate and say, okay, we've got these guys coming back or these guys moving on. Now we look at what our needs are. And I think what really helps them out too, BK, they don't have to worry about shuffling numbers now with the NCAA eliminating the initial counter limits. You know, all you got to worry about, Bucky, you know what that was like, man. Oh, well, you know, we got – Wait, 25, so we signed 22 last year. We can roll oh, yeah. three back and, and all that stuff and trying to juggle numbers, make it work. Hey, man, as long as you're at 85, by the time all these guys get to campus, that's all you got to worry about now. So for Sark that, and, and that personnel department, that's going to make it a lot easier to figure out the stuff. And then, but then come the decisions. And again, Bucky, I, I yield the floor to you. Like, you've got to decide, hey, are we better off taking an off-ball linebacker out of the portal now? Or should we earmark that position for a high school guy in the 2025 class, knowing regardless, even if we have to wait another year, that kid's going to end up being a better player and it's a better use of a scholarship over the long haul. So they're just at the point now, Jeff, yeah. they're just at the point now that this isn't about depth in the portal for them. This is plug and they're yeah. expecting the guy to come in here. And in game number two or three, that person's playing. They're, yeah. they're, they're a big, you know what, when it's time to, for a guy to take a blow for two series, that person's coming in. And he's not a stopgap guy. He's a player. That, yeah. That's that's what it looks like for me now. You know, when they went to Portal last year and they got the, the secondary guy from Wake Forest or whoever it was, my expectations were that dude was coming in and he was going to be playing a lot, only to find out they didn't vet, investigate. He was just okay, I guess. I he just never fit into the system. And Gavin Holmes, Gavin Holmes has been solid. You know, he's been yeah, I mean, solid. but it, it, yeah, but from now on, when they go into Portal, you're going to find out. You know, I think the same thing for these wide receivers. When they come in here, yeah. they're players. They're they're they they're going to be more than solid. They're going to be really legitimate kind of players. Yeah, I mean, you you know, they had plenty of options in the transfer portal wide receiver, and like they might not be done in the portal adding receivers. Just just well, to I, put I, would, a, I would think another one would do. Just to put a little bit of a buffer between you know, not necessarily Jonte Cook, because I think we could all agree, like in the limited action we saw from him this year, he's he's ready to go. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's the rest of that group and how much do you want to lean on true freshmen? How much do you want to lean on a guy as talented as a guy like Ryan Wingo might be? How much do you want to lean on him? You know, they might not be done in the portal. But to your point, Bucky, they had a the, the 
the transfer portal depth period at wide receiver is, is, is it's a pretty deep pool of talented guys. That's but, interesting. You know, it wasn't Juice Wells. It wasn't Deion Burks. The guy they wanted, the guy they targeted was Matthew Golden. That was the guy they zeroed in on. He was their number one target, and they went out and got him. To your point, they're not just going to take guys to take guys right. from the portal now. If if you're if you're a guy coming if you're a guy coming to Texas from the transfer portal, you're going to be that guy that's counted on. You might not be necessarily starting. You're, you're right. going to be counted on to play starters reps and be a starting caliber player. Yeah, I think that's where they are right now. I think moving on to the SEC, I I think the build up away this program is built now. It's not about growing depth. You know, we used to always talk about the line, the offensive line depth. They have that now. Any if so, if they ever got a lineman now, that guy's coming in to start. He's yeah. not coming in to back up somebody. He's coming in to start. And for David Bendel, let me ask you this, Jeff. Why wouldn't he come back? I mean, he's – are you talking about him going to another school or are you talking about him entering the draft? Well, I mean, he's got a, he's got a COVID year if he wants to use it. Um, or just playing I, the game of football, I, continuing to play. Yeah, I think the most likely scenario right now for Benda – and again – I, I keep saying this because I think you have you have to mention it. If Texas goes on and win a national wins a national championship, that could change decisions for a lot of guys. That True. could change what they're thinking. You're uh, right. But right Are you now, better off getting a young guy who can. Yeah, you're right. You know, if BK wants to sit down and you know tie me to a chair, put the gun to my head, and let me tell you what I think David Bend is going to do. I think probably right now the most likely scenario is he comes back to Texas for one more year. Right. which would at the very least give you that veteran presence in that linebacker room just to kind of usher in that new era of, you know, really with Anthony Hill and Leandro sure. LaFowle at some point taking over that position group. And oh, he, he got, got more- better this year, and he got better this yeah. year. I thought he was much better than he was last year. Yeah, but, oh, by the, by the way, in, in addition to, you know, finishing up a, a signing class and getting ready for a college football playoff semifinal, Sark's got to hire a linebackers coach too. So there's yeah. that, there's that added on to his plate. So uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a fun time though, man, to, to be a Texas fan and to follow this program. Look, I mean, we we've, we've gone through a decade plus of being here in December and either no bowl game or you know or Alamo getting, Bowl getting ready for another trip to San Antonio uh-huh. and you know kind of thinking about next year already. And man, it's fun to be thinking mm-hmm. about, dude. They. They're gonna. They're competing for a national championship right now. Texas is, and to be there in year three under Sark, that's a good thing. And a BK, I think it goes back to the point that uh, you and I've talked about before, and that I made earlier, man. When when you look at Texas recruiting at this level, and especially now you throw the NIL advantage in there, dude, this is this Texas fans. This is what it was like at one point following this yeah. program. Like I, I know for some Texas fans, it's kind of an outside the box type concept to think of it but this is what it was like at one point and it's uh yeah. I, I as long as this staff stays hungry and i have no reason to believe that the, that they'll get full they'll get full of themselves um i think this is this is just going to keep keep rolling right along for for a little bit it's it's tough to think are you going to have another run like mac had where you win you know 10 plus games nine years in a row man i don't know but i, I do know this I, i'm i'm confident that that Sark can be the guy that can get them there based on. You know what? I hate taking up. All, I hate taking up all your time and all your stuff, but I'm still going to do it. I still got to ask you, what about Sark and the NFL? What about the chargers, Jeff? What, in your mind, uh, won't they start looking at him too? I mean, he's uh, what he's done with the wide receivers and the quarterbacks, uh, a team like the chargers. Why wouldn't they? I mean, Texas is going to pay him no matter what yeah. he's going to get paid. But I mean, in, in his mind, does he look at that at all? I mean, he might, but I, I think Sark at this point, you know, I think the big crossroads for him was, you know, the end of his time in Atlanta, I think when he made the decision to go back to Alabama to mm-hmm. be the offensive coordinator, I, I think at that point, and again, this, is, this isn't this is anything Sark has told me or said on the record explicitly, but I think at that point he decided that, you know, the college game is probably a better fit for him, just kind of maybe based on his personality, I think roster management, you know, kind of being over the whole thing. Uh, and I think I, I think the impact he can have on young people building relationships, I think a lot of that stuff that Sark values, I think works better in the college game. Okay. Um, plus, you got to think, too, I mean, it, it would it would be a gamble hiring Sark to run your NFL franchise because he's only got the handful of years. I mean, he was a quarterback's coach for North Turner for one year, and then he was in, in Atlanta for – was that two years, I think, with, with yep. Dan Quinn as as the play caller. So, um, yeah, we know he's not going to go from being a Texas head coach to being a coordinator in the NFL. That's, no. a, oh, that's, no. a, step, that's a step down in the football hierarchy. Uh, but, 
you know, at the end of the day, I, I would I would worry about that stuff, Bucky, if it ever comes to it. I, if I was a Texas fan, wouldn't spend too much time worried about if an NFL team is is going to come poach Sark. Now, your your plucky underdog, those constant you know teams that nobody gives them a chance, the Michigan Wolverines, uh, that's the furthest thing from blue blood status. They really have to come up from from behind all the time. Sure. I'd be worried about the Chargers contacting their head coach. And seeing if uh, if maybe Jim Harbaugh wants to get back in the league and coach Justin Herbert, but yeah. you know I don't I wouldn't worry about that with Sark right now. Jeff, we'll let you go with this a Facebook comment. Would you like to respond to Ugon this morning? So this is one of those deals that uh, I'm going to have to send like a thousand dollars to somebody in Kenya or something. <laughs> I don't know what that is. And okay. I, I, I and get give two, him your credit card number. I get two thousand back or some deal, you know. Oh man, you're the man, Jeff. This is Thank always you, fun. Jeff. We uh, look forward to listening to you with Jordan here in a little bit more than an hour. On it's only an hour, but uh, thanks for popping on for a few. Dude, more man. But is it is it this fun though? Like we're talking about oh. a freaking national championship game. We're talking about Texas getting elite talent. Man, this is this is what it should be at Texas. This is where it should be all the time. Yeah, we've been to hell and back, and I'm here to tell you that back is a lot better. Yes, it is. Are you saying we're back? Did you just say we're back? Yeah, I think when you're when you're in the when you're in the CFP, I think you're in the safe zone. Okay, yeah. now we could go goes. unback, I, but we're we back we right now. Unback, yes. No, we're we're back. <laughs> I thought you know, BK. I thought about uh, Chris Hummer and I decided one time we were going to have a is Texas back meter up on the side if we could get the graphics working right. And on a given Saturday, it's like. Oh, they're they're kind of back. They're teetering to back, and then you know you lose a game. It's like very much not back, and it just kind of like, needle just kind of moves moves back and forth. And the are you back? It's like teetering, like they're like the spring game, and like right before the first game, that whole summer, it just kind of teeters right there between almost back and very back. And, and it was, but you know, it's that's one of those ideas that got left on the cutting room floor. We're here. We're here. We're where we are right now. Texas that's is good. here. Yes, that's a great way to put it, Bucky. Doesn't matter if you want to say they're back or not. They're here. Yes. Absolutely. Jeff, appreciate you, brother.